Well, good morning, Dallas Alliance Church. My name's Jared. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, and you're going to hear this more than once. This is a very empty room, uh, and it, it, it comes with both uh, joy and heaviness that, that we are coming to you through a audio and visio source somewhere out there in La La Land. And, and I wanted to start this morning uh, with announcements, because I'm not actually preaching this Sunday. Miriam is. And so announcements, and if you know and you're part of our normal family, you know that I stink at announcements. So let's just get through this. Uh, We're not going to do our normal two-minute prayer today. Uh, We've been walking through praying for different 501c3s and different individuals and and ministries in and around the Dallas area that we see have been and are ongoing with their uh, intentionality of loving their neighbor. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to invite you that this Wednesday we're going to do this whole thing uh, all over again, except for we're just going to pray. And so tune in for that. Look for that Wednesday, probably five-ish. We'll see when that comes up. Uh, and, and just be ready for that. And that's it for announcements. But I do want to just walk through one thing. As we are uh, walking through this COVID-19 thing, uh, I find, especially in my heart, that it's real easy to get down, right? All of my life has been disrupted. My vacation was canceled. Um, I get to watch my kids be hurt and disappointed with school and friends and all of these, these pieces of my life that I can just look at and go, they're all negative. Um, so I wanted to spend uh, two minutes looking at the positives. Because as our staff, as our pastoral staff has sat down and talked and prayed, what we've realized is, is even though there are some negatives, and I don't want to make those small, the reality is, is there's tremendous amount of positives that have come out of this. And the first one that that we talked about and that we prayed over was there's a forced rest that is really just being laid upon us, right? There's this COVID-19 Sabbath, if you will. Uh, our, Our homes are being forced to come together. Uh, I keep seeing images on Facebook and Instagram of, of like, this is what home ec looks like in the Neely household, and, and they're, you know, making cupcakes and, and things like that. And so there's this, this forced gathering happening amongst families, which I absolutely love, and we, we see God working in that. Uh, we, we also see there's a redeeming nature to what you are actively watching right now. Most of us probably watch Facebook or Instagram or whatever gram that you are watching and viewing through more than we should. That's just the reality of where we are right now in culture. We we have this mild addiction to electronics, to the internet, and we we search for information on that, and, and probably a third of that information is appropriate. The rest of it is not. And over the last two weeks, what I've got to watch... Is, is just the gospel, just be pushed and forced into these avenues where, where normally we can kind of escape life. We're being force-fed the truth. And so uh, we definitely see this, this beautiful, redeeming thing that's happening, that God is working through something that uh, most of the time we would say is culture, and sometimes we would say culture is bad, where the reality is, is we are now being forced by what is happening to go into the world and reach people where their culture is, which is a beautiful thing. The last thing um, that, that I want to say that, that we have noticed as a staff is there has been this, this overwhelming evidence of the providence of God. Uh, whether it's family or, you know, less planes in the sky, so less noise, more intentional interaction. God has prepared us for all of these things. And another one that I just kind of want to mention church-wise is, is finances. Our doors are still open, which is just amazing. Nobody's here. Uh, And so that makes it a little bit more difficult and way more uh, challenging for us. But we know that this is a temporary season. And and in the next two weeks, three weeks, whatever that looks like, we're all going to gather back around. We're going to share germs and shake hands again. And and we're going to be able to come back to this place and see family and love family. And so I wanted to say that we we are thankful and we recognize the providence of God even in that, that, that we can still do what God is asking us to do. We can still step into our calling and just proclaim the gospel, share the love. We can, we can edify the body of Christ. And, and that is purely because of that, that foresight, that, that, that offer of God before we got to where we are now. So with that, I'm going to pray. He's going to lead us in worship. Miriam's going to come up here, and she's going to talk to us about some difficult stuff because those are the sermons I ask her to do. And, and uh, we're going to love God. 
So let's, uh, at home, I'm going to ask that you bow your heads with us, and let's, let's just go to our king. Father God, we, we love you so much. And Lord, I, I, I am so thankful for those things that you have placed before us, uh, even in this season, even in a time such as this, God, you have just been so provident. Your, your power, your authority, and your blessings have just gone before us, and we are just now starting to step into those things, Lord, and we just thank you so much for that. Father, I pray uh, this morning as Miriam gets up and leads, Lord, that you just anoint her with your spirit this morning, God, that her, that her words are just the outpouring of your love, your grace, your mercy, and your invitation. And for Caleb, God, this morning, I pray that you just, you just charge him. Give him that zeal that just pours out of him as we, we enter into this beautiful position, this posture of submission, this place of worship. Lord, I don't make light of what is going on, and I know, there, I know that there are people suffering. I know there are people that are afraid and scared. Uh, and God, I, I ask that you just love them where they are, just like you did yesterday, and just like you will tomorrow. And Father, we ask these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, good morning, church family. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, those of you who are watching the live stream or later, uh, we're just glad you're with us to, to worship our creator and our savior uh, and just dive into the word. Uh, I'm going to invite you right now. Um, I don't know about you, but last week I was, I was just laying in bed starting the live stream. And I'm, I'm going to invite you now to either just, just scoot up to the edge of your seat to stand up. Uh, just just uh, let's, let's be ready to engage uh, in the presence of God. I know it it's, might be a little awkward watching for us from a screen, uh, but, but the good news is that uh, Jesus is everywhere, right? He's not just in this building. Uh, he, he's with you now. So even as we, there might be a little bit of a disconnect or it might feel a little awkward, uh, I'm still going to encourage you to sing. You can still clap. Uh, let's, let's just enter into uh, the presence of our God. I'm the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Sing it out, I got it God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God.
I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Cause you are when you make your miracle work. Promise keeper, hide in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. And I believe you are waiting. thank you that you're working even when we don't see it even when we don't feel like it feel when we feel like you're not moving God thank for the truth that you are thank that you that you're always working you're always making a way you're always being the light in the darkness and even in the season now it's no different Father, I just just pray that. Just pray for peace right now. Lord, I just pray that we can rest in the, the truth of knowing who you are. And knowing that you're always going to make a way. That we can always run to your arms. That you're always greater. pray for Miriam. Father, I just pray that you speak to her, speak through her. Father, I just pray that, that your word will penetrate our hearts. That you would soften our hardened hearts to receive what you have. Lord, I just pray that you continue to mold us more like you. I just 
ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Um, it's a little bit strange to meet with you in this way. Uh, I imagine you guys are at home in your jammies, drinking your coffee, having breakfast as a family. Um, I love that we can still meet this way. I will say it's very strange preaching to an empty room that's very cold, um, but I, I just love that we can still do it and that we can be connected and engaged together in this way. Um, today we're going to continue in our uh, series, our study of the Sermon on the Mount. Specifically, we've been digging into how Jesus calls us to act with others. He really came and he, he took everything um, that we did, right, the way that we, we acted, and he really turned it on its head. He said, basically, I'm going to come and everything that you've been doing, we're going to change that. You're going to live like me. Previously, Pastor Jared had been talking about how our yes needs to be yes, right? He, he talked in essence about how we are the reflections of Jesus, and when we don't follow through with what we say, or in essence we're dishonest, um, people will project that onto Jesus, and that's not accurate. We become unreliable, and people believe that Jesus is unreliable, and we, we become a stumbling block to people um, and their ability to come to Jesus. And, and that's a hard thing to hear, but um, Jared made the joke about giving me a hard sermon, but I think that none of these topics are really easy ones. Um, all of them are going to be a challenge, and I think that's a good thing because I don't think we've been asked to come to church uh, for the easy. We're, we've come to be challenged. So one of the other things that, that Jesus challenged in this Sermon on the Mount was the way that we give. This means that we're going to be talking a bit about giving, if you didn't catch that. Uh, and it's a topic that's talked about quite a bit. And um, the way we're going to be talking about it isn't in the terms of should we be giving and tithing. Um, and I think it's a really um, relevant thing that we're going to be talking about because uh, of everything that's happening right now, that, that there's a lot of need in our communities. But the thing I like about this is this sermon was, was scheduled months ago when Pastor Jared first put together this sermon series, before any quarantines or hoarding began. It's kind of crazy. It's like God knew what was coming, um, and he prepared for this. So again, I'm going to say this isn't a super feel-good sermon on giving, um, but I think that I want everyone to really dig into what God's saying, because there is something for everyone. So it, even if you think that you, you've got this giving thing down, and like this is your spiritual gift, I still want you um, to challenge yourself and, and lean into what God might have, okay? We're going to be putting ourselves under a little bit of a microscope, um, all of us, what, what it is we, that we're feeling when we give. We're not off the hook if we, we feel confident in our ability to give. So I guess my request is that we would open ourselves to the Holy Spirit uh, and what he might be working in us this morning. Uh, and I promise he is working. We just need to lean into what that is. So I am going to pray before we get in. Part of it is recentering. This is a new way of doing church. And so for me, I just need to recenter myself as well on what God has for us today. Father, we just thank you for creativity that you have created us to be creative people, um, and that we can still be the church, even though we can't meet in a building together, God. We just ask that you would be blessing this time, and, and that these words would be yours and not mine. Anything that's of me, God, I just wish that you would do away with, so that all of the focus is on you and what you have for us today. Open our hearts to the Spirit, and, that it, and just let us feel his presence, God. We love you, and we seek you today. Amen. So let's talk about giving. Last year, our church, Dallas Alliance, 
we get reported to the Alliance Northwest District, the district that we are a part of. Um, we, we told them that we gave approximately 17,000 to international missions. We gave an additional 12,000 to uh, outreach within our own community and an additional 21,000 to our own missions trips. Given the size of our church, about 100 people on any given Sunday, um, that's a pretty significant number. That's pretty impressive. That tells the district and that tells me is that we're a church that gives. But the question that I want us to start this morning with is why? Why do we give? And I actually want you to answer that. Take just like two seconds in your home. Um, if you're watching by yourself, again, we're always going to encourage that you shoot things into the chat and participate, right? We want to be engaged. But I want us to just take a moment and ask ourselves, why do we give? Our Sermon on the Mount scripture that we're going to be talking about uh, and looking at this morning is found in Matthew 6, 1 through 4. Uh, you're going to have to turn to your own Bible, get it up on your phone, however it is that you access scripture. If you don't have a Bible, stop by the church. We're happy to give you one. Um, we aren't going to be projecting it because although we're figuring out this tech stuff, we're not quite all the way there yet. So... Um, follow along in your own Bibles, Matthew 6, 1 through 4. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So going back to that question from just a minute ago, why do we give? Why do we give to the needy? Why do we care for the homeless Visit the widows and the orphans, feed those who are hungry, fight injustice in the world, etc. There's a little word in this passage that I really want to focus in on. It reveals a much bigger truth that I think we can often skip over. Jesus in this passage says, when. When we give. It's not a question of if we give. He's saying when. There's an expectation for Christians to be giving. We've been commanded to give. And as stewards of creation, right, part of creation is people, so we are therefore stewards of people, then we, there's this expectation that we are to be giving and caring for the needy. That is the expectation of our king. In Deuteronomy 15, 11, it says, there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in your land. Again, I think this is a very real and potent piece of scripture as we face the uncertainty of what's to come in the wake of these extended quarantines. We are expected to open our hands wide to the people around us. Not just a little bit, but fully. And the Jewish leaders of Jesus' time also knew this. They knew they were supposed to be giving generously. They are commanded to do so by God. Uh, but what we see in this passage in Matthew is that the reason for their giving no longer was really about God. It was actually about them. That's why they needed to do all the trumpets and the praise was because the heart of their giving was no longer God's command. It was themselves. And I don't want you to hear that I think that our church's generosity is not at all about Jesus. I 100% don't believe that. I know that there are people who love God and give from a generous, a generous heart um, and out of love for Christ. But I think it's still vital that we, myself included, 
just take a moment to evaluate the hearts of our giving. So why am I giving? Am I giving because it makes me feel good? I get this warm and fuzzy feeling. I hear that a lot when people give, right? Have I fallen prone um, to complacency because it's, you know, giving is just what I've always done. It's, it's routine. It's habit. You know, I, I cut that tithe check. Actually, for a lot of us, our giving is on auto draft from our bank account. I don't even think about it anymore. It's not really an act of worship. It's just it happens. Am I giving because it gives me a sense of control? And this is a hard one. And if that's you, if, if finance is how you control your world, then I think you need to take an evaluation to see if that need for control is a stronghold in your life and address it. The reality comes down to, am I giving for any other reason than Jesus? Because obedience to Jesus is our motive, and if it's not, then it's wrong. As harsh as it sounds, we should not be giving because of the poor and they're in need. We should be giving because God commanded us to. We should be giving because as we pursue Jesus more and more and we become, look, become to look like him more and more, right, we're reflecting him. That's what our community sees. That should be what the cause and effect. As we submit everything we are, right, we have and we do to Christ, taking care of those in need, fighting injustice and loving people is a byproduct of my pursuit of obedience and my pursuit of Jesus, King and Savior, right? Our motives matter. If I'm giving from myself it will always be incomplete, but if I'm giving from, the, from Jesus, then it's always going to be more and sustaining. So now that we've addressed the one word in the passage, we're going to take a look at a little bit of the rest of it. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. There are two inseparable truths here that I, I want us to take a look at. It does not say that if you give for the wrong reasons or from the wrong motivation or whatever you, however you want to say that, if you don't give from the right place, then God can't use it. Nowhere in scripture does it say that. The truth that we all need to remember is that God is going to use whomever and whatever he wants to bring glory to his name and bring the kingdom here. What it does say, and that's the second part that's inseparable and that I want us to look at, is that our reward, if that's our motive, is going to be fleeting and incomplete. If your motives are uh, for giving, yourself, giving to yourself, right, this praise, the praise of man is all you're going to get. And I can tell you with copious amounts of experience that that's not going to last. That, re that praise of man won't be sustained. It's short-lived. And when that's our reward, no amount of giving will ever be enough for us. It actually makes me think of this TV show I've been watching called The Good Place. Super funny show. Terrible theology. But if we're going to Netflix for our theology, we have a bigger problem that we probably need to address. Um, anyway, I'm going to try and minimize the spoilers in, in this show in case anybody wants to watch it while we're quarantined. All three seasons are on Netflix. The current one is not. Um, just throwing that out there. But so there's this character, her name is Tahani. And Tahani, when she lived her life, she, she gave to charity, she did all these fundraisers, she threw parties for rich, famous celebrities in order to raise awareness. It sounds like she had a really hard life, right? Um, but what you see is she spent her whole life doing these good things, giving to others. But when she dies and she finds herself on the other side, she is faced with the reality that her motives had very little to do with others and much more to do with her. She spent her life doing this because people loved and praised her in the moment, but quickly moved on. 
In order to maintain attention, she had to maintain her giving and charity. It wasn't until she was forced to evaluate her motives that she saw that they weren't as pure as she originally thought. So is that us, church? When we really look at our motives and our our heart of giving, is it as pure as we thought it was? Is our motive Jesus? And it's 100% okay if your answer to that question is yes, Jesus is my motive. I mean, that's my prayer is that that's all of our answers. I don't want to discourage you from answering honestly yes. But if your answer is no, there is still hope. God is good and God is gracious and he will not give up on you because your motives were a little bit off or misplaced. Sanctification is a process that we believe in in at Dallas Alliance Church and and sanctification is this process of being transformed into the image of Christ for the benefit of others as Robert Mulholland puts it. It's this journey that's going to have hiccups and detours. We just have to be willing to let the Holy Spirit show us what those things are and then give him the authority to kind of course correct us to where we should be. I also want to take a look at the end of this passage, right? The part where it says, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. I always thought this was kind of an interesting picture. Um, I don't consciously think about what each hand is doing. I mean, if we're being real, I've reached for my water like five times and I'm not even thinking about it. I mean, now I am. But we don't think individually about how each part of our body is working, right? It just becomes natural that it's happening. And they don't argue with each other. If they did, it'd be a really awkward puppet show. And so that's not kind of what we're talking about. We're talking about how this giving, this heart becomes so natural because it's a part of who we are, like it's second nature. But even in this, right, this secrecy, our our motives can be misplaced and it can miss the mark because if if the secrecy becomes so important that it actually becomes the focus of, and that's our heart of giving is the secret. It's, again, it's wrong. Reminds me of another, another TV show I really like called Bones. And I'd like to say that all these TV references are because we've been quarantined and that's all there is to do. But I can't say that. I just, I just like TV and movies. Um, actually, uh, referencing them fits in really well with what we've been doing in youth group as we've been looking at where Jesus is in pop culture because he is present. He's everywhere. Uh, So in a way, you can just say that I'm giving you a taste of what we've been doing in youth group for the last bit of our series. Okay, I'm done defending myself. I just like TV. Um, And so I'm going to use Bones for this as well. So there's this episode where one of the characters, Seeley Booth, he's being super weird and secretive and starts to cause those people around him to worry about his behavior because he used to be addicted to gambling and so there's this fear that he has relapsed into that and then later some of the characters discover that he's been making regular visits to a children's hospital and so then there's this fear that there's something wrong with his daughter christine as the show goes on and people are worrying um, his wife Temperance Brennan, the one they call Bones. And if that's a spoiler for anybody, you are eight years too late to call that. So they're married. You should still watch the show. But Temperance takes um, Cam, one of their friends who's been the most concerned, uh, and she takes her to see what's been happening. And what it turns out is that Booth has been organizing and throwing a carnival for the kids at that hospital. And the reason for all the secrecy that they give is this verse. When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. That is what he claimed all the secrecy was about. His attempt to divert attention from himself actually brought more attention than if he'd just thrown the carnival and didn't care whether or not people knew because it wasn't about whether they knew, it's just what he felt called to do. If working so hard to keep a secret ends up drawing all the attention anyway, 
was it worth it? The point I'm trying to make here is that we can go so far the other direction that we actually end up in the exact same spot. If secrecy becomes a part of the production, because that's really what it ends up being, it's a part of the production, then is the heart genuine? Because again, motives matter. I really quick want to look at two other stories in scripture that reveal something about our motives. The first is in Mark 10, 17 through 27. When Jesus is talking, I'm going to paraphrase to cut down on a little bit of time, but you're welcome to turn there later with your family and read it because it's still all really good in in its entirety. But in this passage, Jesus is talking to a, a person who we only have reference to as the rich young man. The young man comes to Jesus and he asks him, how do I inherit eternal life? And then the young man goes into this long list of things that he's done, right? He's like, I haven't lied, I haven't stolen anything, I haven't committed adultery, right? I haven't had sex with someone I'm not married to, Um, I've been good to my parents, I've been honoring to them, I haven't murdered anyone, I feel like he was looking for a gold star there. Um, But he didn't do all these things, he did all these things that were right according to scripture, and then he asks, what else is there? I just love Jesus' response in verse 21 because it leads with such compassion. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Do you catch what the man was missing? He was missing the heart and motivation that was Jesus. The things that he did were all right according to the law, but his heart was in the wrong place. Even in this though, Jesus was still Jesus, and so he loved the young man even though he was wrong. He saw the young man and he saw that who he was and he loved him where he was at and called him into something better following Jesus. And so I want to just take a moment and say, if that's what you're being called into this morning, embrace it. A life motivated in full surrender to Jesus. If that's it, don't let it pass you by. To paraphrase a worship song that I'm kind of obsessed with right now, um, surrender it all to the one who surrendered everything. So the next piece of scripture I want to look at is also in Mark. As much as Jared loves the the book of John, I love the book of Mark. And so Mark 12, 41 through 44 is the other story. And I like the, the fact that the last story of kind of looking at the negative motives is a little bit longer. And then this passage is just four verses, right? It's kind of like Jesus is saying, it's just this plain and simple, nice and short. Mark 12, 41 through 44. And he, Jesus, right? And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who contributed to that offering box. For they contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had and all that she had to live on. It doesn't matter how much she gave or didn't give. It wasn't about how much attention she got either, which was none. No one was cheering for her. No one was really even paying attention to her other than Jesus. And the only attention he brought to her was to him and his own disciples. He didn't call out everyone in the room. He just brought it to the attention of those who needed to hear it in that moment. For this woman, her only motivation was God. Her obedience in giving even a penny was honoring and glorifying to him because it's about quality over quantity. I love how simple this story is because that's where it leaves it. 
There's no major follow-up. There's no explanation of what Jesus is trying to get across here like you get with some of the parables. It's just this lady who had practically nothing who walked up, right? She had no husband, which means she has no income and no one to support her. She just walks up and gives. Because it wasn't a matter of if she was going to give. It was a fact that she was, right? Because she follows Christ. And so there was that expectation like we talked at the beginning of giving. And she didn't make it about her. I feel like we've all experienced that person who when they do give from their need, you know that they're giving from a needy place, right? They do draw that attention. We kind of call, I, I mean, I call them sometimes the woe is me people because they want you to see that I'm so good because I'm giving out of a place of need like this widow. If, we were, if that was our heart, then we wouldn't say anything, we'd just do it. But there are also those people we see in this passage of scripture who are on the other side. And their motives are just as wrong. They're giving from abundance. And that's not what we're necessarily called to. We're supposed to give from our first fruits, not our last. Because you see, when we give from abundance, it's easy to make the glory our own. Look how much I have. I can give so much. But when we give from want, right, when we give from a place of I'm also in need, then the glory is his and his provision um, is the, comes in the way that only he can do it. So what do we do with all this, right? It's kind of like information overload. We've had everything about our generosity questioned this morning. What do we do with it? How do we apply it? This is going to be two parts introspective and one part action. So the first thing is we need to ask. When I give of my time, my finances, my goods, why am I doing it? If it isn't out of obedience, why is it? We should take a moment and, and look back at the way that we've been giving and examine that. Right? Ask ourselves, why have I always been giving? Or have I been? Maybe that's where we need to start is, am I giving? And then why, why will I do it? The second thing is to evaluate. So ask and then evaluate. To whom will this bring glory? Me or Jesus, right? Who am I trying to bring glory to? Why am I pursuing this, right? Before I give, take an, a moment to evaluate your heart. And this might not be something that you have to do every time that you give, right? Maybe just at the beginning as, as we're kind of reevaluating these things, it's what we do. And maybe it's something we come back to from time to time because it's good to recalibrate even our motives um, just a little bit from, from where we're at. So ask, why have I been giving? Evaluate, why am I giving and who is the glory for? And the third thing is, Act. <laughs> Actually do it. Right? Give out of love for Jesus and out of obedience um, for his call to love others. And when we do, let's give open-handedly to everyone in need, not just the ones I think are in need, but to give to everyone in need out of generosity that can only come from the Holy Spirit. At the beginning of this section of our series on the Mount, everyone was given one of these cards. I'm going to you can't see it very well on your screen, but if you're um, a regular attender, you know what it is. If you've lost yours or if you're new joining us today, um, you can just make one at home. It's, there's nothing special about this paper. Actually, some of them are cut kind of crooked, so yours might be nicer. Um, but what it says is on the front, we wrote the name of someone that we were going to live Christ out to. Not just talk about Christ, but actually live um, that uh, example to these people. And so each week we've added something that we need to do, right, that this Sermon on the Mount calls us to do. And the first one is that we need to pray. Pretty self-explanatory, pray for people. Um, but I think what, something that comes with that is that in order to know how we need to pray for each other, we need to be in community and communication with each other. I can't pray for needs I don't know you have. 
The second thing, right, that we talked about even at the beginning, and, and Pastor Jared gave us, uh, was that our yes needs to be yes. If we are a ref- reflection of Jesus and we are unreliable or we are wishy-washy, um, <laughs> then that's how they're going to see Jesus, right? This person you are personally trying to reach, that's how they're going to view Jesus. So let your yes be yes. We need to be people of strong character, but not just any character. We need to be of Christ's character. And today for you to add here where it says giving to the needy, um, I've said it a a bunch, so hopefully you caught it, but what you're going to add is that motives matter. When you give the motive and the heart behind it, matters. And this isn't just about tithing and giving to the poor when you give to world vision or compassion. That's not just what I'm talking about. And your motives for that don't, uh, aren't what I'm referencing here with this card. When you're living out Christ to the person you, you have chosen, right, the, on the front of this card, your motive matters for why you're trying to reach out to them. For some of them, they are in need but they're in need of Jesus, and your motive for sharing him um, with, that, with that person matters. If your motive is anything other than Jesus, you need to check yourself and run yourself through this ask, evaluate, and act process. But also remember that just like with the rich young man, God will always see you where you're at, look at you with love, and call you to follow him completely. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to be in a safe environment, in a church that loves and and homes that care, um, and an opportunity to come and actually confront ourselves with these questions, that we can um, lay out our hearts before you and have you um, convict them where needed and, and just encourage where needed. God, you have called us to love and to give. And so I just pray that we continue to be a family who does that, a church that does that, but that our motives would 100% be obedience to you. And from that place of obedience, God, I ask that we would be generous and that would overflow into our community and it would be a blessing and that meeting the needs of others would be all about you and not about us at all, Father. We know that you have the ability to provide, and so we lay that out as well. That as we meet the needs of others, we know that you will provide for them and you will provide for us. We love you, God, and we know that you have the ability to do this, and so we lay it all at your feet. We love you, and we pray in your powerful name. Amen.
benediction this morning is going to come from that Deuteronomy 1511 passage. Um, this blessing, I, I wanted to extend beyond that um, because I, I think that as we pursue Christ, right, as we pursue the fruit of the Spirit, my, my blessing to you is that would you be people who are blessed with that fruit, that fruit of generosity that is so great um, that it, it is a defining feature of not just who you are, but of this church and this community. For since there will never cease to be poor in the land, we see that and we're going to continue to see that. Uh, for there will never cease to be poor in the land. May we be a people who follows the command of Christ and that we open our hands to our brothers, to the needy, and to the poor wherever we go. That's my blessing for you guys this morning. Be the people who give and give from obedience to Christ. We love you. And because I know we'll get a phone call if I don't do it, all God's people said, amen. We love you guys. <laughs>